Here's what happened the last time we interviewed Stuart Butterfield. Stuart Butterfield. Oh my goodness! <laughs> it's Jared Leto, everybody. <laughs> this is the smartest Not guy quite a joke out there, but thank you, Jared. <laughs> yep, Jared Leto, the actor, who's also a tech investor, photobombed our chat with Stuart Butterfield the seemingly quintessential Silicon Valley serial entrepreneur. But Butterfield's story is anything but. In fact, he founded both of his companies by accident. Flickr sold to Yahoo for 20-some million dollars in 2004. Today, Slack, a workplace collaboration app, is worth more than $7 billion, and it's now battling Microsoft, Google, and Facebook. Joining me today on Bloomberg Studio 1.0, Slack CEO and co-founder, Stuart Butterfield. Stuart, thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. You had an unconventional childhood. Your parents were hippies and chose to raise you off the grid in British Columbia. What was that like? Well, I was, I was a pretty little kid, so um, I'm not 100% clear on it. But it was, in many ways, an idyllic childhood. Um, I was raised in a log cabin, and it's a great story now, right? Because I can sound like Abraham Lincoln, with no running water until I was three and no electricity till I was four. My father's from New York and my mother's from Montreal, and they really had no idea what they were doing when they tried to, to live off the land. So pretty easy to grow like a big zucchini. Um, but you cannot live off zucchini alone. <laughs> but when I was about five, we moved to the city so I could go to a school, and that was like a little bit more normal experience. Your name wasn't Stuart. Your birth name is actually Dharma. Yes. Which um, means the way. Yeah, uh, it's a complicated concept, but central to Hinduism and to Buddhism. How did that shape you? And what kind of a kid was Dharma? Um, well, I was very curious. My mom tells this funny story of Around a mile away from us, there was uh, another family, and they had a son who was maybe six months younger than me. His name was Noah, and he's the only other kid I knew. So it turned out that I understood Noah to mean other child, as opposed to that was his name. And she took me on a train to go see family back east, um, and had never been anywhere like where there's this many people around. And I got on the train, and I was like wide-eyed. I went, Noah, 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 because I thought like. I was just, I didn't realize that there were other children. Um, so that's a little bit weird. So given that seeing other children was a rare occurrence, when did you see a computer for the first time? By 1980, we had uh, an Apple IIe. Mm -hmm. um, and I was, I was just super into it. So seven, I'm in second grade. It was the first class at my school to have computers in the classroom. In Apple Basic, you could pretty easily do some basic graphics. You would just say, like, you know, make this little square this color, make this little square this color. So I made um, kind of an interactive multimedia experience for the other children, which was flags of the world, but only the super easy flags, like France and Russia <laughs> and Ireland, like basically any tricolor, big horizontal bars, and not like Brazil or Mexico or any of the fancy flags. You studied philosophy in college. Yeah. I mean, you wanted to be an academic. So really big interest in computers when I was a kid. But when I was an adolescent, uh, I kind of lost interest. It wasn't until I arrived at university where I got an account on the school's Unix machine um, and discovered the internet. This is 1992, so just like a little bit before the web started taking off. Um, and that was mind-blowing. And suddenly I was back into computers because of networks, because of the internet. As soon as the web became popular, I taught myself HTML. I could make web pages. That was like a great summer job. By the time I finished my um, master's degree, with really like no idea what I was going to do except for be an academic, because there's not, you know, the big five philosophy firms aren't always hiring. <laughs> um, it was 1998, and the dot-com kind of initial boom was just really in the, the upswing and I had some very marketable skills. And so instead, you joined a startup. That was called communicate.com, which it's too long of a story, yes. but the end of February 2000, so like a couple of weeks before the crash, I quit, because I just couldn't stand working there anymore. It was driving me crazy. I thought I was gonna, or I thought I was walking away from about $10 million in, in equity. I ended up getting bought out for $35,000, mm -hmm. which is $35,000 more than anyone else made if you if you stuck around. And GradFinder was started by, um, the person I sat next to on my first day at, at this job, and I convinced him to, to quit. Um, he'd been running GradFinder as kind of a hobby, and we should start it up as a business, and so we did. And that actually sold for a yeah. decent amount of money. Yeah. And um, you made something. I, I made something, and that was pretty fast. But now it's 2001, and now it's like the trough, and it's um, 
WorldCom and Enron are happening, and, and not that long after 9/11, um, and the economic outlook is pretty dark. Like the Nasdaq was down 80 percent, S&P 500 was down 65 percent, and not a lot of optimism about the internet. But there was this burgeoning movement of self-expression and, and stuff online, which was blogging. From the late 90s into um, the early 2000s, there was just like a, such an active community and people were, were really innovative, but there's also these relationships. And it, it kind of harkened back for me to what I had seen um, 10 years prior when I first got online. And that's been a theme for the, the whole career. So started, uh, a company to build a web-based, massively multiplayer game. A never-ending game. Yeah. It's it called, was literally called Game Never Ending. Exactly. Um, and this is 2002, and guess whether people were interested in investing in that at that time. Unlikely. <laughs> yeah, and it, and it definitely, like, there was an audience for that uh, who were really enthusiastic, but a, a pretty small audience. We had raised a little bit of friends and family money, we'd put some of our own money into it, and we got to the point where the, um, the only person who got paid was the one person on the team who had kids. Um, and we just couldn't do it. So uh, it, we ended up making Flickr, which was, um, you know, obviously like a big turn. So in the wreckage of the dot-com bust, you basically started Flickr by accident. Yeah. What made you see that Flickr could be something? Desperation. Um, I think, I mean, fundamentally, we had developed a bunch of technology for the game that we thought was really interesting in its own right. Instead of an inventory of items in the game world, you had a shoebox, we called it, of, of photographs. And it was really cool from a tech perspective. So it demoed really well, and people were super impressed. Like, I didn't know you could do that in a browser. But it was a really not a great product because you had to be online at the same time as the other person in order to share photos with them. But so. the concept was very new. I mean, it sounds obvious today, photo sharing. The constant theme from like 92 to the game never ending to Flickr is really this idea of the use of competing technology to facilitate human interaction. And in some sense, I'm agnostic about what the purpose of that is. So it could be for play, it could be for creative expression, it could be for work. Are you agnostic about the result? Because it could also be for good or for bad. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, uh, I think technology gives us options and there's going to be good and bad things that people will do with it. Part of the reason I have the career that I have is when I was born and how, you know, and when I grew up because um, you know, you and me are in the last generation of human beings that will know life both before and after the internet, despite the fact that there are some um, negative consequences, like you know, people now have better technology so they can do the same bad things that they did before with, with bigger consequences. Um, it's a huge plus, and I think as a species, we, are, we should be grateful that we got the internet. Flickr was so hot that a year after you launched, Yahoo bought it. Mm -hmm. You sold it. Yeah. For 22 to 25 million dollars. Is there a real number? Yeah, in there? It's, um, it's, that's pretty, I don't even remember at this point, but around there, yes. You moved to Yahoo mm -hmm. and you became like a dot com star. It was kind of the, the first thing that was a phenomenon since the original dot com crash. So it's like, you know, 2004, we were on the cover of Newsweek. This is me and my now ex wife, Katarina Fake, co founder. That issue came out. I'm in New York City and I'm flying back to the West Coast and I'm in JFK. And I walked, you know, get through security, go to the gate, and I see oh my god, oh, there's the magazine, like it's out now. So I just grab a stack of them and I put them on the counter and the woman scans the first one and then she peels it off and she scans the second one and without looking up at me, she says, honey, these are all the same. Um, <laughs> and I said, no, I don't know, that's okay. And she said, looks up at me and then she looks at the magazine and she looks up at me and she's like, like just like lights up, she's so excited. And then she reads a thing, which I don't remember exactly what it says, but like, web 2.0, how Flickr and MySpace and something else are changing the web and she's like, crestfallen, like, ugh. <laughs> You've talked about how one of the strengths of Flickr was the unique and welcoming culture and mm -hmm. how Katarina would welcome every single new user. Today, that doesn't happen on Facebook and Instagram, and in fact, online hate is a huge, huge problem. Do you worry about hate on social media? Yeah, um, I do. I mean, it's one way of talking about inside of companies is, is your culture is the worst behavior you're willing to tolerate. Mm -hmm. Not everyone tolerates the worst behavior on, on Twitter, but collectively, as a society, as a business, uh, you know, as a, as a culture, we tolerate it in the sense that it hasn't been eradicated. It shifts the boundaries of what's acceptable in a way that kind of encourages more bad behavior. Um, and I think it probably has a negative impact. On the other hand, I think the net impact is hugely positive. 
Um, I think like it connects people in a way that they never would have been connected before. I think Twitter in particular, who gets a lot of um, criticism, has been really outstanding at amplifying the voices of people who would otherwise not be heard. But they're also amplifying negative voices as well. Yep. Um, and should they be doing more to stop that? They probably should. Yeah, but my point is just that it's not like this is an obvious, terrible thing that we, would, as, a, as a society, would be better rid of. There were people who said terrible, nasty things in the dawn of radio and used that to incite both like mobs and also political movements, which were super damaging later on. We, we, as human beings, I think we take a little while to figure out how to make use of technology. And sometimes it takes generations, right? Like we have to figure out how to move technology towards the consequences we want and away from the consequences we don't want. Ten years ago, twenty years ago, we would have been public long before we got to this stage. You left Yahoo. Yep. You and Katarina broke up. A lot of things changed. Mm -hmm. But history actually repeated itself. Yep. You started another game, mm -hmm. that failed, and you started another company by accident. <laughs> yep. So it was me and, uh, and three other members of the original Flickr team. Um, we all worked at Yahoo, and then when we all left, we thought, okay, well, this time we can't fail. Like, there's 10 times more people online, and hardware is 90% cheaper than it used to be, and everyone has faster computers, and the internet is way faster, and we're all more experienced, and we definitely failed again. So it was a more ambitious project, and we were able to raise more money. This was Glitch? This is called Glitch, yeah. We're working on the game. We're using IRC. IRC, for, for those people who are not familiar, is, like, it's instant messaging, and it's based around what they call channels. And a channel is like a chat room. Um, it can, you can give it a name, and um, you use the hash symbol to denote the name of the channel, which is where Twitter got its hashtags from. Unbeknownst to us, we're building, like, designing Slack in the background, but in a totally subconscious way. It wasn't any kind of explicit decisions. It was whenever there was a problem that was so irritating that we couldn't stand it, we would address it in the minimum number of minutes and kind of get back to what we're supposed to be doing, and we'd let that kind of cook. So what was the moment you realized Slack was the thing and Glitch was most certainly not? It happened the other way around. It was a little bit like, um, there was a moment and it was like late at night and I hadn't been able to sleep well for a while. I was just really worried. There's always like one more thing that we could try and then this thing would be the thing that really made the difference. But it was just, again, I think like Game Never Ending, a little bit too weird, a little bit too esoteric, a little bit too unfamiliar for people. and. I just realized I don't, I don't believe it can work anymore. So the next morning, I told the board and I told the co-founders that we, ha we have to shut it down. While that was happening, we were thinking, like, what do we want to do next? Because we all wanted to work together. And we all also realized we would never work without a system like this one that we had developed inside um, of the company that was making Glitch. Maybe that's something that other people would want. So Slack now has 8 million daily active users. 3 million paid users, 70,000 paying teams, 65% mm -hmm. of Fortune 100 companies. Yeah, it's um, not what I expected. And the potential seems like unlimited. So what are the goals now that you far outpaced your own expectations? Well, I mean, I think we're, we're unbounded in, in terms of um, opportunity and we're unbounded in terms of resources. And the market is just way bigger than we thought. You know, there's, there are, ex-China, maybe 200 million people in the world who will inevitably be using Slack or something like Slack. So we don't necessarily win, but the advantages are just so big um, that everyone will eventually switch. And there's 100,000 plus people using Slack every day inside of IBM. But there's also like farms and dentist's offices and like small tax preparers. There are police departments using it. There's like the Norwegian Department of Welfare and Labor uses it. All, like, Almost every academic research lab here in San Francisco, UCSF, Berkeley, Stanford, uses it. Um, it's used inside the federal government. It's, you know, like, it, the range of, of utility was way greater than we thought when we first got started. So you've raised hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah. And in the past, you said it was easy money, you didn't need it. Mm -hmm. Is it that easy to raise now? Or have economic conditions changed? Certainly not for us. I mean, I think what's what's happened is there's really been this increasing separation between the most successful company and sometimes the most successful companies in a category and everyone else. Um, 
the VC market still seemed pretty hot, uh, just in the broad sense. I worked through the dot-com crash. I literally personally held shares in Lehman Brothers over the weekend that they went bankrupt. I didn't think that stocks could go to zero, but they can go to zero. So I'm, I'm conscious of the cycle. So you're holding it for a rainy day? Yeah, I, mean, I think it's, it's a great hedge against a significant change in market conditions. Now, Microsoft just launched free Teams. Mm -hmm. Facebook has Workplace. This Microsoft product has been billed as a Slack killer. Yep. Is that cutting into your share at all? No, it, it hasn't really shown up um, in, uh, in like actual usage at customers yet. Where it does show up is in the sales process. Mm -hmm. And I think what'll be really interesting is, um, you know, people talk about new Microsoft versus old Microsoft. Where I think that will make a big difference is what the policies are for customers. First of all, it's been it's good validation for us. Second of all, we're way ahead on the on the product side. So you're not worried about it? No. Okay. You said you're running the company to get ready to go public, but you're not necessarily going public. Where are you now in that? Um, kind, of, kind of in the same position. I mean, I, I think it's uh, it's difficult to contemplate, or there's not just been, there's been not many outcomes where we don't end up going public. Um, I don't have any kind of timeline. Um, we're not in a rush to to achieve that. It, it is an unusual circumstance because I think in any other like you know ten years ago, twenty years ago, we would have been public long before we got to this stage. You know, like we're we're a big company with hundreds of millions in revenue, um, and we're still private. Would you consider selling? I mean, we've chased speculation that there's a buyer out there for Slack at an insane valuation. There's definitely people who would be willing to buy it. What? So, first of all, all their solutions are wrong. It doesn't work that way with private companies. So it's a much more circumspect kind of conversation. Hey, Stuart, if you would be interested in talking about how our companies could work more closely together, we would also be interested in having that conversation or something like that. And if we don't respond positively to that, like if we don't say, yeah, that sounds great, let's talk about it, there's no offer. No one ever just says like, you know, here's a, here's a check, you know, want me to sign it? We're so optimistic about the future and having so much fun, and I personally would like to do this for another 20 or 30 years if I can. It doesn't make sense to, to yeah. sell it. Uh, and I also just, I feel like our, when I say unbounded potential, I mean, we should end up as big as Microsoft if we're able to execute um, in the way that I hope we can. By the time I figure something out, suddenly we're 50% bigger and that doesn't work anymore. You haven't shied away from speaking out against President Trump. You spoke out against candidate Trump. And when I interviewed you for my book, I remember you talking about how you thought the world was getting better and then the day after the election you realized it wasn't getting better. What do you think about the world today? Well, that's, that's pretty dramatic of me. I like to think about this in terms of policies at this point, and there's all kinds of policies which I think they're, it's worth vigorous opposition for different reasons, right? So immigration policy, for example, on both moral grounds and also like just an understanding of what has made this country great historically. Total other end of the spectrum, the trade policy, is something that can have a really significant damage and effect on both the American economy and the world economy. I still think we're gonna have some repair to do, um, but 10, 20, 50, 100 years from now, I think we'll um, be in better shape than we were. You come out in support of Planned Parenthood, you spoke out against the travel ban. When you make these and take these political stands, how do you decide to do that? Is that just a personal thing? You have a company? I think we have to, to pick our battles as the company. I think as individuals, um, absolutely free to, to make their own choices. And I, I try to more separate um, my activities as an individual person from those of the company. I know you are nervous about being held up as a model for diversity. But the truth is, your numbers are far above industry average when it comes to diversity. And you, personally, decided very on in Slack's life cycle to make it a priority. What was the spark that sort of brought you that realization? First of all, it wasn't just me. Um, it was like a, a, a company level decision. And it was when we were around 30 people and we looked around and we we're like, hmm, this is looking more or less like every other tech company. It just caused a lot of conversation about what is it that we can actually do to make a difference. But the real impact, I think, was more likely to come in building an inclusive culture, one where people of all different types can thrive, one where critically 
uh, people are less likely to fall out of the industry. Because the longer um, someone from an underrepresented group or a woman in technology stays in, um, the more success she has in her career, um, the greater the odds that she's going to bring people from her network, that she's going to be a mentor, that she's going to be a role model. Um, and that's the way we're going to get lasting change. We don't have it figured out. Um, what we have seen happen is we made some positive moves, and we've taken a really open experimental approach to the things we're willing to try to increase both diversity and inclusion. Um, and as a result of that, we've attracted a lot of people. And success begets success. 43.5% of your workforce is, is female versus 30% industry average. Your numbers are way better across the board, whether it's women in technical jobs, blacks, Latinx. Facebook and Google, meantime, just released their recent diversity reports, and the numbers have barely moved. How can the rest of the industry move this in a substantial way? And what is your advice to young entrepreneurs who are starting at the beginning? Well, so the second question is much easier, which is, start it as early as possible. I guess that answers the first part of the question too, which is once you get really big, first of all, it's hard to move things on a percentage basis. Mm -hmm. I think people have unrealistically high expectations of what kind of change we can see in the short term. Um, but the long term, I think we'll see a much bigger and more profound change than anyone realizes at this point. Slack is dramatically changing the future of work. In many ways, Slack increases flexibility, but it also means we're connected to work yeah. all the time. Do you think about the irony of that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think about all this stuff. If you're a company or an organization that has really serious cultural problems, using Slack can exacerbate it. Like, mm -hmm. it can actually make it worse. If you're a company that has really healthy patterns of communication and there's a high level of trust and a high level of respect, um, using Slack can make it even better. The thing I think is really interesting about the future of work is you look at people in their individual functional roles today versus like you know a few decades ago, and they are just massively more powerful in their ability to get things done. But where we haven't seen as dramatic an improvement, um, and what ends up being the limiting factor on performance is communication. How difficult or hard it is to gain the kind of alignment you need. Because the difference between the best and the worst performing teams is like far greater than the best and the worst performing individuals. But we've concentrated most of our effort on like individual worker productivity and time management skills and like life hacks and to-do lists, get, getting things done and stuff like that. Um, and far less on what is probably the more important thing to, to change is like the degree of transparency, clarity around goals, trust, respect, alignment. The output there can be an order of magnitude or several orders of magnitude greater. How do you see your role? changing over the next five, 10, 20 years. You said you want to keep doing this. I feel like I'm perpetually six to 18 months behind where um, I should be because we've been growing so fast. You know, we've only been in market for four and a half years and by the time I figure something out, suddenly we're 50% bigger and that doesn't work anymore. I'm sure that I would not have actually said this out loud if you asked me two years ago what my job is as CEO, but what I would have thought privately inside my own head is my job is to be the smartest person um, in the, you know, the company or in the room or whatever, and to make all of the really important decisions. It's definitely not the job. But the fundamental responsibility is to increase the performance of the organization as a whole. In an environment where you have no limit on the opportunity and no limit on the resources available, it's really just a matter of figuring out like how to, to amp it up, you know, how, how to, to grow more quickly, how to um, make customers happier, how to, uh, how to do all of that better. And the continual learning and improvement for the whole organization is going to be the driver of our success. All right, we'll see how amped up you are in five years. Yeah. Stuart Butterfield, thank you so much for joining us. Great thank to have you. you.